Well, we are in Matthew chapter 13 and looking at the parables of the kingdom. So if you have Bibles or you can read on screen, we're going to get right into the passage. It's a short one. Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. And so let's read it right now. Here is another illustration that Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree and birds come and make nests in its branches. Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in the three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Jesus always used stories and illustrations like these when speaking to the crowds. In fact, he never spoke to them without using such parables. This fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet. I will speak to you in parables. I will explain things hidden since the creation of the world. Okay, two short stories, uh, and perhaps you're familiar with them, and perhaps today we can look at a slightly different angle and see what we need to learn from them about the kingdom of God. Jesus, after his baptism, goes right into a period of temptation, and then right after the time of temptation, he begins to preach, and this is really crucial for us, because often we talk about the gospel about Jesus, right, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that is essential. But there's also the gospel of Jesus. He had a message that he brought himself. And sometimes we don't pay attention to it. And I think that hinders us from growing as disciples of Jesus. What was his message? It starts like this. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. His message, his good news was about the kingdom about the kingdom of God. And so that's what we're trying to unpack over these uh, few Sundays in the summer as we understand the message of Jesus. Remember that when we hear the word repent, instead of thinking of a giant club that's meant to turn you around, we think of the Greek understanding of repentance, which is having a change in your thinking. So let's change our thinking about the kingdom. And then the Hebrew understanding of repentance is a welcome home, <laughs> come home, return. And so we want to change our thinking and return to the Father and return to an understanding of the kingdom that Jesus gives us. And that's so important. So if we are to grow as followers of Jesus, and I hope you want to, I hope you still want to, if you want to grow as a follower of Jesus, we need to respond to this message of the kingdom and grow in our understanding and experience of the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and its righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. That's the key. And so we need to do it and do it more. Well, thankfully we have lots of help when it comes to understanding the kingdom. Uh, it was a favorite subject of Jesus. And that's important. As you go through the gospels, make a note of the subjects that Jesus spends a lot of time on. And then maybe make a note of the subjects that Jesus spends almost no time on, and then focus on the ones that he does spend time on, right? That's, that's the key to our understanding. What caught Jesus' attention? What did he want us to know? One of the things he spent a lot of time on was power, and talking about power. And it's so important for us as individuals to understand that, and as communities of faith to understand that, because when we get it wrong, terrible things happen in the world. And so this is part of what we're learning as we begin to understand what Jesus is saying about the kingdom of heaven. So Matthew 13 has these parables of the kingdom. And parables are more, like, I'm not sure I really like the translation in the NLT. It's more than just an illustration. It's more than just an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. Parables are actually meant to get past our defenses. And we talked about this before, how sometimes when Jesus told a parable, they wanted to kill him. So obviously it was more than just a happy story. So we need to understand that. They're meant to get past our defenses, but they're also meant to destabilize our thinking so that we can learn the truth. Sometimes we need that. 
Just a, a little bit of a warning. There's going to be a few motorcycle illustrations in the sermon today because we went for a nice ride yesterday and enjoyed it very much. Um, but when you're motorcycling, one of the things you've got to learn is you actually have to destabilize the motorcycle in order to lean into the corner. And it does feel like that. It feels like you're falling. And if you fight it, you'll go off the cliff or something like that. And so you kind of have to destabilize in order to change direction. And I think that's what Jesus does with parables. He's intentionally destabilizing our thinking. He's shaking us up so that he can change our direction. And if we don't get that, if we miss that, then we're going to go the wrong way when we start thinking about the kingdom. Because I think we think we understand the kingdom because it's a word that we're accustomed to. Maybe we don't use it in everyday language today. But many of us here, me included, are citizens of the United Kingdom, also citizen of Canada, but citizens of the United Kingdom. So when I lived there, I was subject to the laws of the kingdom. So I benefited from the prosperity of the kingdom. I even cheered for some of the teams of the kingdom. I even waved the flag from time to time. I was almost conscripted to defend the kingdom. And so I assume that I know things about kingdom. So when I hear the word kingdom, I automatically infuse it with my own understanding. And that's where it's dangerous. The parables bring us enough surprise and confusion to reveal our ignorance about God's kingdom. And so we have to be careful that we don't take our understanding of earthly kingdom and automatically transfer it over to our understanding of God's kingdom. We realize that it's something different altogether. Here's my point, and I think it's really important. At least I do. Hopefully you do. Just because Jesus borrows the language of empire doesn't mean that he endorses the values of empire building. We have to understand that. But I think we confuse it. We conflate it too often. We put it together. We take our understanding of kingdom in an earthly sense. And we say, aha, that's what Jesus is talking about. And so we want to advance the gospel by force. We want to colonize the neighborhood. We want to, you know, conform people to our own image, which we believe is the image of God. And so we have to be really careful when we're talking about these things to understand that just because Jesus borrows the language of empire, doesn't mean that he endorses the values of human empire. And we discover this as we get into the parables of the kingdom of God. We discover that the kingdom of God operates according to different values, that it has a vastly different life expectancy, right? And that it has a different point of origin. The kingdom of God is not of this world. And so in some ways, we need to, as part of our discipleship process, deconstruct our understanding of God's kingdom, which is often based on human empire, and allow the Spirit of God to rebuild our thinking. We need to literally repent, to have a change of our thoughts, return, pardon me, return home to the values of the kingdom that Jesus is teaching us through his parables. Okay, another motorcycle illustration, which maybe you've heard before, but when I was a kid and we were just in the Okanagan, so I was reflecting back and telling some stories which might have horrified my in-laws a little bit. They hadn't heard them before, but anyway, there it is. Um, we were driving past Mount Bushery. If you've ever been in the Okanagan and you're driving that area, there were no houses there when I was growing up. And in fact, we used to just ride dirt bikes around there. And I didn't have my own dirt bike. My mother would not allow it. But I had friends in low places. So, now I'm not saying we had good dirt bikes or we rode them very well. They were all pieced together, pieces, they were, they were not very good. And there were sometimes little 80s or sometimes even little 50s runabouts and we'd, we'd ride them till we ran out of gas or set something on fire. And so that's what we did all around. And so when it came time in my early 20s, when I decided to get a legitimate license for a motorbike, I assumed I knew things about motorbikes. I assumed I knew how to ride. I assumed that when I got to the test, I would pass. I failed three times. <laughs> Anybody want to go for a ride this afternoon? I can, <laughs> totally safe. 
I failed three times. Why? Because I went into that exam with assumptions that because I had ridden a motorcycle, I knew all about motorcycles. And I think sometimes when we come to the kingdom of God, because we have the language of kingdom, the language of authority, the language of government, we understand what it means to be a citizen in this place, then we make the mistake of trying to transfer those values over into the kingdom of God. And we fail the test. <laughs> we don't pass. And so there's a relearning that needs to happen. So some of you I know have told me that you're in a, a season of deconstruction. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be shy about it either. Let's, let's work through that together. Uh, there's an invitation sometimes to question, even to have room for doubt. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. <laughs> but don't be afraid of those times when maybe God is saying, I just challenge you to think again about certain things because he wants to disrupt us just enough to change our path. And that's so important that we go through that um, with confidence that people will surround us and still love us and that we will walk in the walk of the spirit. The reality is that we've developed a lot of bad habits, just like I developed bad habits when I was riding dirt bikes around Mount Bushery. And sometimes as human beings, as we try and enter the kingdom of God, we need to shed some of those bad habits that we've learned from the world around us in order to fully inhabit the kingdom of God. It's like Martin Luther and Robert Farrar Capon has said, and I've mentioned it before, the kingdom of God is all about left-handed power. <laughs> And if you're left-handed, just think opposite-handed power. It's all about left-handed power. It's unfamiliar to us. We need to be retrained in it. Last week, I decided to restain our deck. And for some unknown reason, I decided to do it with a brush. I have a sprayer. I have a roller. But I decided, how hard could it be? By the third board, I was questioning my sanity. Like it's a 16 by 14 deck. It's big enough that I should have done something other than spray it with a four or brush it with a four inch brush. And so partway through, I thought a good strategy would be to use my left hand as well. That did not go very well. <laughs> Honestly, I just, I tried and it wouldn't work. I was all messed up. I couldn't get it in the bucket. I got all over me. And it was a lesson to me, a reminder of this sermon, that sometimes when we engage in the kingdom of God, the power in the kingdom is unfamiliar to us. And so often we just give up and we default back to our right hand. We default back to the power that we know about in the world. Power that is sometimes violent, Sometimes that is coercive. Sometimes it's filled with greed, right? Sometimes filled with pride, selfishness. And somehow we need to allow the spirit to put the brush in our left hand and retrain us, even though it's painful and difficult and slow. But it's the way of the kingdom to relearn what power looks like. So one example that we see this, and we've been learning this through our Thursday evening Bible studies, is by looking at the Beatitudes. We, we learn just how upside down God's kingdom is, how the power differential is so different in the kingdom of God by looking at the Beatitudes. And some of you will know the, the passage I'm referring to in Matthew chapter five, and we're looking at that together. You're welcome to come join us Thursday evening, 7 p.m. right here at the church. We're here for about an hour and 15, and we have a great time together. But in the Beatitudes, what we learn is that the people that we assume are blessed aren't necessarily the ones that are blessed, right? We assume, not just in the time of Jesus, but even the time today, we assume that the people who are blessed are the people who are prosperous, right? Hashtag blessed, look at my boat, right? So we assume that, whoa, that guy's really blessed. Or the people that have like 10 children, wow, you're really blessed or cursed, I don't know, but... Um, <laughs> But we, we assume that fertility is a sign of, of blessing that was evident in the scripture, but I think it's still embedded today in our understanding of what it means to be blessed by God. Or we assume that, that simply being healthy or being in love or having a partner or being happy is a sign of God's blessing. And it might be. I mean, that's, I'm not questioning those good things and those good gifts that we share. But the Beatitudes turn things upside down. Suddenly Jesus comes along and he says, wait a minute. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. 
God's blessing rests upon those who are in mourning. God's blessing rests upon those who are meek. God's blessing rests upon those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They're dissatisfied. They're yearning for justice in the world. And it's such a strong yearning that it's so painful, a burden to carry. And God says, you're blessed because you're hungering and thirsting for justice in the world. And that doesn't feel like blessing. And that's the kingdom. It doesn't feel like we're used to. And it's so upside down that it takes a retraining. So as we turn to Matthew 13, we get some of the retraining, and hopefully we'll begin to piece this together. We learn through the parable of the sower, which starts things off, that the message and the messenger of the kingdom of God will be largely rejected by the world. That largely it's rejected. Three-fourths of the soil reject the seed in some capacity. And there's great excuses for it. Right? The cares of this world have taken away you know, the, the productivity of the crop. Or the birds of the air, they came and they, they stole the seed. Whatever the excuse is, the kingdom doesn't take. Because it's difficult to be retrained to left-handed power, isn't it? And so we learn that the message and the messenger of the kingdom of God will be largely rejected, and so will we. Jesus is setting us up to understand rejection as part of the kingdom experience. And in the parable of the weeds, we see that the kingdom of God will face opposition, not just rejection, but, but an enemy comes and actually sows some weeds. And then the surprising reality is God saying, the, the, the farmer saying, just leave them be and I'll sort it out the end. And we begin to understand that the kingdom of God is not up for us to judge who's in and who's out. That we leave that up to God in the end, Right. So we look today at the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven, and there's something different about these two. There's no rejection talked about in these ones. There's no opposition talked about in these ones, and there's no judgment. Most of the other parables have elements of rejection and opposition of judgment. These don't. Instead, what we see in these parables is the power, the permanence, and the pervasiveness of the kingdom of God. I worked really hard to get three Ps, so please write them down. The power, the permanence, and the pervasiveness of the kingdom of God. That's what we see in these two short stories about the mustard seed and about the leaven or the yeast. So what about the mustard seed? Really quickly, I just want to really pull out one main point. The mustard seed story is an example of what I would call rhetorical hyperbole. Now, you don't write that down. That's that's, that's just gobbledygook sometimes. But what we mean by that is that Jesus tells an intentionally exaggerated story in order to make a point. What do I mean by exaggerated? Well, the mustard seed isn't actually the smallest of all the seeds. So we're going, yeah, we know there's smaller seeds than the mustard seed. And it doesn't actually grow into the tallest of all the trees. What is Jesus doing here? He's jarring the people, the listeners. He's setting them off balance a little bit with this kind of rhetorical hyperbole, this exaggeration in order to get attention and to make a point. Well, what is his point? The point is really simple. The kingdom of God starts small, grows large, and is unstoppable. That's part of the point. That's, I mean, it's, not, it's really not rocket science in some ways. This is the kingdom of God. It starts small, it grows large, and is unstoppable. But there's one other point that I want to make about this, and this is what I'd like you to take home and think about. Mustard seed, as an actual plant that grows uh, within the region where Jesus was teaching, it grows like a weed. And you have to be very careful if you decide, as Luke points out, to plant it in your actual garden, because it will take over. Once you plant it, it grows wild and it grows into a great bush and suddenly all you have in your garden is mustard. You're longing for some ketchup or relish, but there's no ketchup seeds. Tomatoes, I guess. But, but there's mustard everywhere. And, and my point is this. I think part of the, the story of the mustard seed is to teach us that the kingdom of God cannot be contained. It can't be fenced in. The kingdom of God is far bigger and grows in a more unruly fashion than any of us would care to admit or would like. 
because we are the kind of people that like to be in control. And so we'd love it if the church had control of the message of the kingdom, but we don't. We don't. And that's why we, we've had this conversation a little bit in our Thursday night studies as we talk about you know, good things that we're called to do and, and peace that we want to see in the earth. And then someone brings up, well, but I see that in my neighbor and they're not a follower of Jesus. We're like, well, yeah, because God is always at work all around us, sometimes with the church and sometimes in spite of the church. So we should never think that we've got a corner on the kingdom of God, that we get to control it, that we get to manipulate it, and that we get to tell the right people about it. That the kingdom of God is this unruly thing. And we kind of just, we got to get caught up in it. And we've got to look for it. Where's God working in our neighborhoods, in our communities? Where's God working in our world? And we get excited and carried away with it because God is always at work all around us. This kingdom, it's like a mustard seed. Pliny the Elder, who's not a Facebook friend of mine, but he's an old guy, I think deceased by now. Yes, he's deceased. Um, he wrote a natural history. It was published like AD 78. So he's been gone a long time. And he writes this. Mustard is extremely beneficial for the health, just so you know. It grows entirely wild, though it is improved by being transplanted. But on the other hand, when it has once been sown, it is scarcely possible to get the place free of it. <laughs> and he's saying, once you sow that mustard seed, you've lost all control. It, it, it's, it's going to grow, whether you want it or not. So there's a lesson here about the kingdom of God. It's entirely wild. It has this unstoppable force that can't be contained. It's not limited by the church, and it's not limited by our sin. And it's not dependent on us to grow. That might come as a bit of a letdown, because I know I grew up with a great amount of guilt of having to get out there and grow the kingdom of God. And yet we're invited instead to participate in this wild growth of the kingdom that God is inviting us into. So that's something about the, the kingdom of God we might see from the mustard seed. What about this leaven or this yeast? What's the hyperbole here? What's the exaggeration that Jesus is talking about that we learn from? Well, this woman, and that's a beautiful feminine image of God that we have here, she isn't just making a couple of loaves for her family. I don't know if you caught this. It depends on your translation. But when she mixes up this dough, it's a ridiculous amount of dough. It's absolutely insane. Some of you might have in your translation that there's 60 pounds of it. Just think of that in your kitchen, on your table, as you're about to make bread, 60 pounds of dough. Robert Farrar Capon actually calculates it this way. He said there's three measures is a bushel of flour. That's 128 cups or 16 five-pound bags. And when you add the 42 cups of water that you need for it, you've got 101 pounds of dough. That's what he calculates it to. This is ridiculous. The disciples are thinking, what kind of woman is this? Who is she baking for? This is a ridiculous amount of dough. And Jesus says, just a little bit of leaven, and that's all you need to leaven, to rise the whole amount, this ridiculous, massive lump of plain, ordinary dough. I think he's talking about us. <laughs> I think he's talking about the world, right? Uh, nothing is, this isn't artisan bread. This isn't craft bakery. This isn't individual loaves. This is just ordinary masses. And Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is just like a little bit of leaven that you need to transform the whole lump, the whole massive lump of dough. The kingdom of God starts small, grows large, and is unstoppable. And here's the interesting thing about leaven or a leavening agent, whether it's yeast or whatever you use to leaven the dough. Once you add it, it can't be removed. There's no going back. There's no stopping it. It can't be undone. So in these parables of power, permanence, and pervasiveness, remember our three Ps of the kingdom of God, we learn that the kingdom starts small, grows large, and can't be contained or undone. 
That's important for us. Well, what's our response? Well, these are interesting parables because Jesus doesn't call for a response. In fact, we, we seem very passive in this whole parable. There, there's nothing for us to do. And we like to do things because, again, it puts us in control. But instead, I think the response to these parables is, I mentioned it before, patience and trust. Let the dough rise. <laughs> Let the leaven do its work. Let the unruly weed of mustard just grow crazy, right? It requires patience. And sometimes this is hard in our world when we're saying God set things right. And God says, I'm working on it, but be patient. Trust me, I'm working this out in my time. But also in our lives, I don't know about you, but when I hear about the kingdom of God and the fruit of the spirit, and I hear about the Beatitudes, and I, I look at that and I measure it against my life, and I'm, I'm like, I am nowhere near that standard. And sometimes I get discouraged, honestly, as I think about where I, I think I should be in my walk of faith, in my trust in God, in my witness to my neighbors. And, and I wonder, is God even working at, in me at all? And then I go back to the mustard seed and the leaven, and I hear God saying, be patient. God isn't finished with me yet. You know the old cheesy slogan. It's true. God isn't finished with us. And not only should I extend that patience to God's work within my life, but maybe we need to extend that patience to one another. To be patient with one another when we make mistakes, when we mess up, when we don't add up to where we want to be. And we exercise patient love, even with one another. Philippians 1 and verse 6 says this. I am certain, and maybe this is just a promise to those who are maybe struggling a little bit like I am, about measuring up to where I think I should be. Philippians says this. I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, who planted that leaven, who planted that seed, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. That's the nature of the kingdom of God in our world. And that's the nature of the kingdom of God, which is not only in our world, but Jesus says is within you as well. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you have begun a good work within your world. Help us to recognize it wherever we see it and help us with enthusiasm to jump on board. May we be co-workers together with your son in the power of your spirit to see our communities, our neighborhoods, our families, and our own lives transformed by the message of your kingdom. Father, I pray for encouragement today for those who face discouragement as we walk along this road and help us and teach us your path. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.